it's so good to be with you. They have got me in 38 cities in seven weeks, which can I just tell you I'm too old for. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, I was going to be home for a few days so I could do some Vermont stores and really so I could be home for autumn and Thanksgiving. And they asked me, would I do a radio tour? And so, you know, picture a radio tour, right? I thought, I'll be in my jammies, in my bed, on the phone. It seemed like a great idea. So I said, sign me up. It turns out that they want you to come to the radio station. <laughs> and so the day before I was about to go on Thacker Mountain Radio, have any of you heard of Thacker Mountain Radio? Thacker Mountain Radio is based in Oxford, Mississippi. Oh my God. Yeah, right, exactly. The day before, in my jammies, the woman called to talk to me about what time I was going to get there. I'm like, I'm on Google looking for flights, you know? And so I, I fly out there. Thacker Mountain Radio is sort of like the Prairie Home Companion does the South, okay? They cover a nine-state area. They have a local personality who's kind of their Garrison Keeler kind of guy. And they have musicians and they have authors on the show every week. And I think they only do it 12 weeks out of the year. So, um, and it's based in Oxford, so it's a real literary town, you know. <coughs> All right, so I fly out there. And they have like 350 people in the audience. So, you know, I'm fixing my hair and running around. And I get there, and I'm in the back room talking to everybody, and I can't find my book. It's about time to go on. And, you know, the one I'd come hoping to sell to all those people, I can't figure out what I do with it. So I, I run, as I'm running back looking for it, this producer woman, who looked like she was maybe 12, <laughs> said to me, now, Mrs. Stimson, you haven't been on our show before. I just want to remind you, don't say the seven words. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I wasn't just sure what the seven words were, <laughs> but I was pretty sure they were in my book. <laughs> and, and I was also pretty sure they were on the page I was planning to read. So now I'm hysterically looking for the book, because I don't want to tell her. And I run back to the bathroom thinking maybe I left it there wasn't there. They had a table with snacks and water, and I was just sure I probably left it there. So I ran over to the water table. It wasn't there, and I said, shit. And she said, that's one. <laughs> <laughs> so I am very grateful to be back in a bookstore where, A, they have my book in case I forget it, and B, I can say the occasional bad word. Um, <laughs> so thank you for having me. You're so lucky to have an independent bookstore in your town. I live next to Manchester, Vermont, and we have the Northshire Bookstore. And I really don't believe that I could live in the North Country without a great bookstore. So uh, you and I all have that in common. You're very lucky to have them. But, and now as an author, I have a no, whole no, new appreciation for the independent booksellers. Um, without them, you know, how do we find out about books? Everybody, t you know, so many people are buying their books on Amazon, but you can't find books on Amazon. You know, one book doesn't naturally lead you to the other, like when you're here and you see something, or better yet, you have a bookseller who knows you and who tells you something's just come in that she knows you would like to read. So I'm grateful to the independent bookstores, as I know all of you are. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so we are, as Penny alluded, a family of five or six, depending on how you count. I know that's a weird thing to say. Um, here's a convoluted sentence. I was married to my oldest husband. Oh, sorry, I screwed up nope. my own convoluted sentence. I was, <laughs> we'll try it again. I was married to my oldest son's father for about 15 minutes when I was 22 years old. Got that? It was a colorful 15 minutes. We could not bear to be in the same room with one another. Um, much less be married. But we had this child, so somehow we had to figure out how to be a family. And so lots and lots of therapy and uh, friends and family who helped us. Um, Steve really did become a part of my family. He had a key to my house and he would let himself in on Christmas morning so that Benjamin didn't have to go more than one place for Christmas. I, my husband for life, the one I married forever that I've been with for 27 years, and I went on to have two more children together and those kids called him Uncle Steve. He really was part of our family. My best friend used to say that coming to our house for the holidays, um, you would have me and, and my husband John and our three children mm -hmm. and my mother and, and my sister and my husband's mother and his grandmother and my ex-husband and his parents who really kind of were kind of divorced. Not really. They'd been separated for years, so they had to sit at opposite ends of the table. <laughs> she said coming to our house for, th for Thanksgiving was just like being in an Alan Alda movie. <laughs> and it was. Steve died suddenly and shockingly three years ago. And we were faced with how we were going to teach our kids about grieving 
when we really didn't know the first thing about it. We'd lost dogs. Um, we always assumed that when we were teaching our children about grief, it would be about their grandparents. And uh, my husband and I had both lost our fathers, but we were little kids when we lost them. And we really didn't know what we were doing. And here, a member of the parenting team wasn't there to help us. Not only did he die, which was annoying enough, but he also, it's kind of funny. I mean, it was kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> but he also left me in charge of his estate. What that meant was that my current husband, the one I married for life, gave the eulogy at his funeral. So what I want you to picture is all those people sitting in the pews, when John walked up, every single one of them went, <gasps> <laughs> you know they were saying, that's the ex-wife, that's her new husband, you know, 25 years, but still. Yeah. And what happened was we were talking about the eulogy, and our son, who was just 26, um, said, I can't do it, and he looked at John and he said, Dad, will you? And so John just got up and started writing it, and of course he was the one. Not only did he leave me in charge of his estate, but he left me his ashes. <laughs> now what would you do with your ex-husband's ashes, I ask you? I, I can tell you that if you put them in your utility closet next to your vacuum cleaner, your house will get filthy. <laughs> you will never want to open that door. Every time I opened that closet door, I could hear him complaining about being in the closet, you know? I'm not particularly neurotic about death and stuff, but these ashes just kind of haunted me. I would move them from place to place. The idea had been, um, he and Benjamin were both fly fishermen. But Steve was kind of an armchair fly fisherman all his life. Um, he, he loved, you know, when we emptied his house, we found about 200 volumes on fly fishing in his library. So he had all these books about, he loved to read about it. And he had all the jackets, he had all the gear, you know, he had a ton of rods, and he had a, a fly tying desk, and he had the hats, and he had the vests, and all the stuff. He didn't really like cold water, <laughs> so that was kind of a problem. Um, but he loved the idea of it. And Benjamin had taken up fly fishing just about a year before his daddy died. When we emptied his house, we discovered that for the last 10 years, every time Steve had bought a rod, he bought two, imagining fishing with Benjamin. So the idea was that he had been to our house a, a few months before he died. He came back and forth a lot and visited us in Vermont. And he and Benjamin had fished at the, at the Baton, on the Batten Hill. No, on the Meadowy. And um, so we thought we would sprinkle his ashes where they fished. That was sort of the idea. And that was, in fact, what he had written in a letter to me in his will. However, that required that our son be ready to sprinkle the ashes. And every time I would mention it to him, he'd say, I, I, I don't want to talk about it, Mom. I, not, not, not yet. I, I, you know. Well, you know, I'd done therapy. I knew I had to wait till he was ready. But the question was, how come I was stuck with the ashes in the meantime? <laughs> I mean, they sort of drove me crazy. And um, along the way, there were a few accidents with the ashes. I got to tell you, I'm going to tell you the story. Um, did I bring my purse? I did. Because um, that means I have my book. Um, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, I will tell you, that year, it was a hard year. Not only did we lose Steve, but we had also had a child who had been very sick. And have you ever just really needed vacation? You know, you just needed to get away. This was one of those years. We really needed to get away. It had been a tough year. And so we rented a little cottage on the beach, and we rented it for a whole month. And oh, this cottage, I can't tell you how happy it made me. It is nothing like real life, being in a rental cottage on the beach, or at least it's nothing like my real life. This house was pristine. You know, there was no mess, there was no junk. It was this beautiful little, because it's a rental cottage. And so it was, everything was painted white, and you know, I just, it, there wasn't any stuff. And my house looks like a bunch of gypsies live there. So I'm in this little cottage, and I could just, you know, begin to feel the weight of that year lifting off our shoulders. It was such a great month. And then we had to go home. <laughs> where, you know, where all the, where Steve was in the closet. Um, and, and, you know, I, as soon as I walked in the door, I felt irritable and crap because I had those damn ashes. I didn't know what I was going to do with them. And I started complaining about the house. 
and you know if you if you don't move very often you accumulate stuff you just it piles up and we hadn't moved for about 11 years and we hadn't we just had a god awful a lot of stuff and two of the kids had moved out and they'd left all their stuff and um and and broken things somehow we accumulate broken things at our house um, i had this beautiful wrought iron table i say it was beautiful it was really beautiful 20 years ago uh, for 10 years it had been in my attic broken I'd meant to find, you know, a welder. I'd tried a couple of guys, and they'd told them nothing. Nobody could fix it, and I kept thinking I'd find something. Never did. So I get home from this vacation feeling oppressed by my own life, and my husband said, well, honey, what if we got a dumpster and just kind of cleaned out the attic and the basement? Would that make you feel better, do you think? And I thought that was a great idea. So we get this dumpster, and this dumpster held 3,000 pounds, we filled it in two days. Most successful diet I was ever on. I loved this dumpster. I mean, we emptied, we threw away stuff every day. Every once in a while, my husband would throw away something I didn't want to go, and I'd sneak it back out. But mostly, we just kept throwing stuff away, and the house felt lighter. You know, I could sort of hear myself think. You could almost hear, I thought you could hear an echo in the house. My husband thought that was silly. But... You know, I just, I, I felt, I was wearing summer dresses, and I felt lighter myself, and my husband said, honey, we should have gotten you a dumpster a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, we actually decided to get a second one, because we still hadn't done the attic, <laughs> and we still hadn't done that utility closet. So we did the attic, and we get to the utility closet, and, um, you know, there was Steve on the shelf where he'd been forever. And I thought, I'm just going to ignore that and start cleaning out the closet. And as soon as I started ignoring him, I could hear him saying, look at here I am sitting here next to the cleaning supply. I mean, I could just hear him complaining. And I knew he was right. So I took him down. Have any of you read Mud Seas in the first book? Anybody read it? Okay. So you guys know how much I love my dogs, right? So what I'm about to tell you, you guys have to just trust that I love my dogs. And this was not a passive aggressive act. I took him down and I... I, well, I put him in the dog food container for safekeeping while I cleaned out the closet, okay? So I put him in the dog food container, and this closet goes back a ways, and it's a thing that we throw everything that's in this closet. It's cleaning supplies, and it's, um, you know, tools and household stuff, and, and there are cup, little, little trays, cubbies that hold all the tools, and there are bags of screws and nails and of course a little bit of glue has spilled so the bottom of those bags is kind of rotted out so the screws are in the wrong spot and the nails are in the I'm telling you this long part so that you will know it took me hours to clean out this closet I was in there for three hours it's summer sweat is pouring off me and <clears throat> as I was cleaning it out I noticed that on top this does not make me sound good, just so you know. Um, but I get better as we go along. On top of the dog food container was the dog food scoop. And the reason it was on top of the container was because the lid to the container had been broken for a really long time. And so I'd been weighting it down with the scoop. And I'm cleaning it. And I thought, you know, why have I kept that broken dog food container? I am not keeping broken things. You know where this is going. Yeah. I am not keeping broken things anymore. I am a new woman, you know. So I took the dog food container and <laughs> put it in the dumpster. <laughs> exactly. And it didn't occur to me for a couple hours. And that was the day they picked up the dumpster. <laughs> So I remember it, it, I called the dump, and, and, the, and the guy who ran the dump called the guy who hauled it away, and that guy called the guy who owned the truck company, and, you know, the guy called the guy called, and it turns out they had not emptied it. So this was good. So we went to the dump, and it also turns out that no matter how calm and sweet your husband is, you cannot ask him to go dumpster diving for the last husband. <laughs> so that job was left to me, <laughs> and uh, and I was not very good at it. The, the, it. When you have a dumpster, you have no trash, because you know every time you get a little trash, you pitch it in the dumpster. So I was digging around in old slimy lettuce and orange juice containers. I mean, it was disgusting in there, and I was fantasizing the whole time I was in there about maybe I could just call the funeral home get the 
him to send me a new box. <laughs> and I could fill it with fireplace ash. No one would know. But then I thought, well, 30 years from now when I'm dead and the kids see real human ash, they'll remember and then, you know, I won't be there to say I'm sorry and they'll have to go into therapy. So I kept digging. Um, but these ashes, <laughs> these ashes became kind of a thing. And I'll read you a little story about them. I like it that you're giggling. Giggling is good. For weeks, he sat there. Mm. I know, weeks. Every time I would open the door to grab the vacuum or get a hammer, there he was. And I could just hear him, Ellen, for God's sakes, this is really not suitable. Would I stick you in an old closet? Come on now. He would have had a point. I guess after all these years, I could carry on both sides of the conversation. Not surprising, really. But here we were. Benjamin had said not one more word about those ashes for ages. Just last weekend, I tried again. Hun, I've been thinking about your dad's ashes. Oh, Mom, not that again. Come on, I'm headed out to the dog trainer. Come on, Mom. Oh, right, right, sorry. Sorry, hon, it's, it's just that I, I, I worry about those ashes. But, but I'm sorry. Take as long as you need. He then gave me that what's wrong with you crazy woman look that he'd honed so perfectly as a teenager. Worry about the ashes. They aren't going anywhere. It's not like it's really him. Come on, Mom. God. He was right, of course. But then he didn't know that I had Steve in the utility closet either. I wondered if that would change the equation any. There's a long, narrow shelf just a bit higher than the door when you open the utility closet. It's the width of the closet, but not very deep. The closet is built behind a staircase. Just a few, so, whoop, I missed a sentence. So it slopes just a few feet in. And this particular shelf was where we kept odds and ends, small odds and ends. The draft blockers, for example. I think there were a couple of pots from kitchen window plants that had died. And Steve, he was right. It really wasn't suitable. I opened that closet all the time. I was constantly reaching in there, and there was Steve. His picture might as well have been on that box, and it was not a happy picture either. His face was all scrunched up and he was complaining. And what's worse is that I knew he was right. Or he would have been if he'd been alive, which he wasn't. I knew that. I wasn't losing my mind. Okay, maybe just a teensy bit. But it was those <laughs> damned ashes. I mean, try putting your old or former husband's ashes on a shelf in a cramped closet and see if it doesn't make you a little weird. Er. <laughs> One day, I mentioned all of this to my friend Ellen Quistel. She was calling to see how Benjamin was doing, but what she got was my little ash problem instead. I don't know, Ellen. I mean, he loves that puppy. I think she's saving his life. Well, that and the fishing. He loved fishing last year, too, but this year, he's just going crazy over it. He stops at rivers and streams all over the place and throws his dad's line in the water. Have you seen his Facebook? It's wild, all the fish he's catching. It's a good thing he's a catch-and-release guy. I'm telling you, Vermont had run out of fish. But Ellen, he won't even talk about sprinkling his dad's ashes. Not a word. I'm not sure I breathe. It just sort of rushed out of me all in one long gush. Now, my friend Ellen was a therapist in her recent past, and somehow telling her about a problem is almost enough to make it go away. First of all, she's brilliant, and she's a calm, rational pragmatist to boot. She can do a little therapy magic when she talks to you, it's like having warm honey poured directly on your soul. He will when he's ready, hun. You guys are doing everything right. Clearly, she knew what I needed to hear. I think the fishing and the puppy are wonderful diversions. He knows you'll be ready to scatter those ashes whenever he says he's ready. He trusts you to help him carry this burden in the meantime. See, smart and comforting. But... Okay, I know, I know, but Ellen, listen, he's making me keep the ashes, and I have nowhere to put them. I mean, I can't leave them out, can I? And I feel guilty for stuffing them away. Please don't tell anyone this, but I have him in my utility closet. Every time I go in there, I can just hear him yelling at me to get him out. Not actually yelling. I mean, I'm not hearing voices. I'm not crazy, exactly, or not really. I wanted to be clear about that part. It seemed like a real important part. <laughs> 
but I can imagine it because you know no one would want to be in a utility closet, not even Steve, not even a dead Steve. I do know he's dead, but I still can't shake the feeling that he'd have a damn preference. I took a breath. We were both quiet for a second, in fact, several seconds, long enough that I started to wonder, Ellen, are you still there? And then, with the voice of compassion, reason, years of experience, a good PhD from Princeton, my friend Ellen said, "Hun, those ashes are real bad juju. <laughs> <laughs> so much for calm and rational. So these ashes kind of, you know, they became a thing. And, um, I, and I, was, I was writing this book, and I didn't have an ending because the idea was that I would have this beautiful ending where we all went to the river, and we scattered Steve, and I would write about it poetically, and you all would think, oh, what a beautiful family they are, you know. But he wouldn't let me scatter the ashes. And my publisher was getting ready to print the galleys. Now, a galley is something, do you guys know what a galley is? Some of you, not everybody. Okay, so a galley or an advanced reading copy. The publisher makes these before the book actually comes out. And it's like a really cheap, horrible paperback copy. And they send it to the booksellers and the reviewers all over the country so they can order the book and review it and blah, blah. So my publisher kept saying, we need to print the galleys. It turns out you cannot say to your child, Honey, can we sprinkle Daddy so Mommy can finish her damn book? <laughs> you just get in it. So I said to them, what if we just left a few pages blank? And, you know, they reluctantly said that they thought they could do that. And my husband, as we were talking about this, said, wouldn't it be funny if uh, we sent Steve and the Ashes out with those galleys and we could just get rid of it and send him all over the country. Well, I thought this was hysterical. So I called the vice president of sales at Norton, who is a guy named Bill Roos, and I love him. He has a tortured sense of humor, and I told it to him. He thought it was real funny, too. Three days later, the UPS truck shows up in my driveway, and I had this big box, and I opened the box, and inside were a thousand little empty glass vials <laughs> from Norton. Well, I oh loved this God. idea. So I looked at that for a little while. Don't worry, it's not as bad as you think. I looked at those vials, and I thought about it, and I thought about it. And uh, I built a big fire in the fireplace, <laughs> and we filled those vials with ashes from the fireplace, and I mailed them back to Norton. Oh my goodness. So Norton thought this was hysterical. And so they printed little tags, and on the front side of the tag was a picture of the cover of my book. And on the back side, it said, Author's dead ex-husband, please scatter somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and these went out with the galleys. Well, Twitter and Facebook went crazy. They were no longer considered my dead ex-husband. The people on Twitter were saying, what kind of ghoul would send her children's father across the country? You know, it was all everywhere, everywhere. So there were these two national magazines that are in the publishing industry. One is called PW and one is called Shelf Awareness. And both of them did big stories about it because they wondered, who is this crazy person in Vermont that is sending out these ashes everywhere? And so after they did the stories, gosh, there was just so much frantic activity on the internet. Well, that Friday, I got a telephone call from a reporter at the New York Times. <laughs> this was the first time I'd ever been called by the New York Times. It may be the last. Um, <laughs> this reporter wanted to know if I had actually sent my children's father around the country. And in a moment of what I can only describe as, you know, a flash of sales genius, I said, my lawyer has advised me not to answer that. <laughs> Twitter went crazy. So did Facebook. It was nuts. And so as a result of that, they put a thing. I have a website, ellenstimson.com. And on the website, they put an interactive map called Scatter Steve. And booksellers could go on and say where they put him. And he showed up in Florida, and Hawaii, and Alaska, and Nebraska, all over the place. And as a result of that, my son said, well, if the whole rest of the world is scattering him, I guess we can too. <laughs> and in that way, we finally made our way to the river and scattered Steve. 
Um, so I thank you very much for coming. This is normally the part where the author asks you guys if you have any questions. I got to tell you though, I hate that part when the author says, does anybody have any questions? And then nobody answers and says they have any questions. And you feel so sorry for the author. So I always talk during this part because I hate that part. And you kind of feel sorry for each other too. Y'all look at each other a little weird. So I talk through this while you all are thinking up your clever questions. And then in a minute, I will ask you. And by then, there'll be some overachiever that will let us off the hook. And we won't have to worry anymore. So it's coming around, right? <laughs> do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> you, I take it. See, there's always an overachiever. Yeah. You can count on it. It works every time. Yeah, Thank you so girl. much. <laughs> My sister says the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So I take it you did get the ashes out of the dumpster. I did. I got it. Okay. You know what? You want to know something though? I threw them away again, actually. So, not the whole thing. So another <laughs> time, another time, it's time has passed. And uh, we've agreed we're going to scatter him. And I went to my local antique store to get some kind of beautiful vessel to pour him out of. Because I didn't want to dump him out of the box in the river. So I get this silver vessel. And I bring it home. And it turns out he didn't fit in it. This man made a lot of damn ashes. So I went back and I got another little vessel. And he didn't fit in that either, which was ridiculous because as many times as I'd moved him around, you would think I would know how much ashes. I mean, he was a big guy. But anyway, so <laughs> I got a third one. And, and finally, what I had to do was divide him, him yeah. among three <laughs> vessels. So I divided him up and I threw the box away. Well, I went to bed that night and I thought, you know, what if I didn't get everything out of that box? <laughs> you know, and after having gone through the dumpster and everything, and he'd been in the closet so to speak, for a year, <laughs> you know, and I felt so guilty, so I got up in the middle of the night in my nightgown, went out to my trash, and I thought, you know, he wasn't this tr much trouble when I was married to him. I'm digging through the trash again, looking for the box, and I pull it out, and sure enough, there was a little bit of ash in there, and um, it was real pissed off ash, too. <laughs> and so I said, I told him I was sorry, and that we were going to sprinkle him in the river, and I took that little bit, and I put it in the garden, and then I double bagged that box, and I was praying for trash day, and it finally came. <laughs> it's amazing what ashes can do. When my my father passed away. This isn't my book, but my father passed away, and I was living in Newport, Vermont. He and my mother were in Arizona. He wanted to be buried in Hawaii, right? <laughs> so the best way that he found, because he wrote everywhere, the cheapest way was to be cremated and mailed, which is uh -huh. what, how he did this. So I went from Vermont to pick up my mother in Arizona. My mother and my Boy. sister and I go to Hawaii. The ashes don't come. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so my mother's getting hysterical a little bit. You know, she's just she was just this tiny, tiny woman who, as a day went on, and another day she went and she got into a little bit of the port. You know, <laughs> but not on a ship. But, you know, and so she, she, she was like going like this, and, and I don't. But be, so I went down. You know, and they have no idea where. My father's ashes were, and finally, <laughs> however this happened, you can't make this up. Some apparently yeah. they put him on the slow boat to Honolulu, <laughs> because, oh, rather than mail it and, and oh, taking the plane. So he took the scenic. He, he yeah. took. Yeah. Yes, he wanted one last cruise. Like yeah. that. <laughs> so I get back. I have these ashes in here, which we're going up to Punchbowl to bury. And my mother says to me, "Well, Linda, uh, she's calling my middle name too, but that that's being." Tapes. That, that, <laughs> are you sure those are John's? And, you know, and I said, well, Mom, I really don't know. Because if you look in, but I, I just said, well, I feel that they are. And I felt, so I poured her another glass of port. So it wouldn't matter to her afterwards. But I hadn't thought of that in years. You got to gotta tell them about the contest, because she ought to be in the contest. There's a, oh. Norton is doing a contest. They're giving away three days at the Equinox in Manchester, oh, wow. um, plus dinner at the downtown grocery in Ludlow. And Which is a great place. It's fantastic. And some other stuff, I don't know what it is. But you have to go to my website, and you have oh. to write a paragraph. First, you have to buy a book. And then, a <laughs> little, little detail. Then you go to the website, and you write a paragraph about how you have used humor and grief in your life. 
and I get to pick the winner. I have had some, I love your story. Thank you for sharing well, it. No, I, I hadn't thought of that in years. But I have had so <laughs> many great stories. Everybody's got a story, you know, about ashes or about yeah. death. Yeah. The One of the women that wrote in the other day, her name was Francesca. And her sister's name is Clara. Let me get this right. And her brother's name is Joey. And her brother is, and they're all middle-aged, and her brother's mentally ill. And he lived with their parents. Her, her mother died. And about three months later, her father died, and her brother found him. And he called her and said, I think Dad is dead. And she said, oh, Joey, we've got to call 911. He said, no, 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 he's really dead. He's dead. He's dead. You know? And she said, okay, we'll call the 911, and I'll be there. I'm on my way, honey. And she lived about an hour away. And their sister lived in California. And so, and the sister was dog-sitting for the weekend in the mountains and didn't have good cell service. So he said, I keep calling Clara, and she's not answering her phone. He said, she's, she said, I know, honey, we're going to reach her. I've called the people that she's dog-sitting for. You know, we're going to get the landline there. Don't, don't leave her a message, Joey. Do not leave her a message. Because the mom had just died, right, and three months earlier. So he said, I, I, I won't, I won't. But he's got a lot of anxiety. And so he was very nervous that they knew and his sister didn't. And so she's driving, and he keeps calling her every 10 minutes, saying, I, I think we ought to just leave her a message, Jessica. I think we ought to leave her a message. And Francesca said, no, no, Joey, please. It's not the kind of thing to leave on somebody's message. It would be very upsetting to Clara. I'm going to be with you in about 10 minutes, honey. I'm almost there. Can you just wait 10 minutes? And he said yes, and she hung up. Right away, her phone rang again, and this time it was her sister. And her sister said, Chess, did Dad die? And she said, oh, he did, Clara. God, I'm so sorry. Did Joey leave you a message? And she said, yeah. He said, guess who's resting comfortably? <laughs> <laughs> I think he thought he wasn't really telling, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so the stories, I thank you for sharing yours. The stories have been fantastic. I like that. <laughs> up anything like and I that. love that she said, you just can't make this up. On my <laughs> book trailer, I actually say that same sentence only with a little fuzzier word in the middle. <laughs> I didn't want to be on tape. I mean, I could have said, but it's just like dealing with, yeah, it was the funeral home, and White actually finally tracked it down. And who knows how long he was on the docks there. <laughs> he probably was trying to run <laughs> Anybody questions? Anything you guys want to talk about? Getting published, writing books, that's what usually people want to talk about, who your favorite authors are. Come on, jump in. Tell them about Alan Gilchrist. I, well, wait. This lady was about to oh, say something. Sorry. I will. Tell me your question. Oh, I was just... Woes or joys of the road. Oh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I travel with my regular work, too, a fair amount. And so I thought I could do this. It would just be no big deal. I was wrong about that. <laughs> 38 cities in seven weeks is just an awful lot. And um, it, it's, you know, I love being in bookstores. And I love hearing what everybody's reading. And I meet these booksellers who are frequently recommending great books to me that I wouldn't necessarily pick up. Um, so that's been terrific. A lot of the bookstores, when you do a reading, they give you a free book. You can go pick out a free book, which is lovely. And so I get all these recommendations that I haven't had before. I've loved that. Um, but I sort of have hated being on the road so much. I, this year, it's not so bad because my youngest son is away for the first time. And so, you know, it's kind of a diversion. He's in Fiji. Actually, today he's in Australia, um, which is 8,010 miles from my house. Um, Google Maps helpfully tells me that at 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm having, you know, an anxiety attack. Um, so it hasn't been as bad because he's away. But it's, har it's, it's harder than I anticipated it would be. It's really the truth. Except I do get to talk to book people, so that piece is great. <laughs> Okay, so Ellen Gilchrist is probably my favorite writer. She is a Southern writer. She's originally from, um, well, I don't know. I think she's originally from New Orleans. She lives in, uh, in Arkansas most of the time now, divides her time between um, Mississippi and Arkansas. And so she has that Southern sense of humor, which I think, it, I think there is a Southern vibe, um, you know, kind of like, who else is Clyde Edgerton kind of has it a little Reynolds bit. Price. Um, Reynolds Price oh. a little bit, although he's more Western. He's got that whole Western piece too. Eudora anyway, Weldy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. She loves Eudora Weldy, Ellen Gilchrist. 
Um, and she writes always, up, all of her novels, she won the National Book Award for her short story <coughs> collection many years ago, um, uh, Light Can Be Both Wave and Particle. Um, but, but her novels are fabulous, and she always writes about the same characters. It's the same family. So she looks at the world and all of its questions through the Han family, and I love that. Um, you meet sort of, you know, the men are all almost caricatures. They're a little bit too macho. You absolutely love them, and you hate yourself for loving them. Um, and you want them in your life, and you hate yourself for wanting them. And the women are all really smart and really clever, a little flighty, um, but they always solve whatever it is that needs solving. And there's always a wise older woman in the mix. I love her novels. Um, the Anna Papers is, I think, one of my very favorites of all time. And she has a new short story collection out right now that is uh, called Acts of God. It's about those moments in our life that we don't anticipate that change absolutely everything we know about ourselves, which happen from time to time. And, um, and they are aging characters. She is about 75 or 80 now. And so as she has gotten older, she has started writing about aging characters, and I, I love that. So she's terrific. What are you guys reading? Or ask questions, but you know, there's Ellen Gilchrist. Nobody's reading? What, what are you guys no, reading? Not... Reading. <laughs> reading. Oh, reading. 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 Good grief. I'm glad <laughs> some like reading yeah. good grief. What a good choice. <laughs> what a brilliant woman and you I must love be. You often. <laughs> <laughs> she is so Who's funny. That? She funny. <laughs> Very mild mannered, actually. Mild. Quiet, quiet. Yeah, skinny. Skinny. I always hear how skinny she is. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, you guys? In, I read The Fault in Our Stars, but that was just... Yeah. yeah, did you like it? I had to just finish it. I just said, I have to get this over with because it's so painful. It was really hard. Yeah. It was really hard. I have moved away from everything that's like that on this book tour because I find that I'm a little depressed in hotel rooms by myself, <laughs> and that does not help me. Right. Um, I was reading the new Ian McEwan, which I think is fantastic, by the way, but I've, but I've put it away. Uh, I'm going to pick it up when I'm a little more healthy. Because <laughs> it's just so, that was so upsetting. It was so hard to read. It was really hard to read. But beautiful. It was beautiful. But beautiful. You read it. Yeah, the prose was fantastic. Yeah, beautiful. Have you heard of All the Light We Cannot See? Oh, I have and not read it, though. It's my favorite book of the year. Really? It's a, it's a World War II book, and everybody says, oh, another World War II book. But, you know, they're so good. Yeah. It's about a, a little girl, a little French girl, who, when we meet her, is six, and she's blind. She lives in Paris with her dad, who works at the some unnamed museum. It's about her, and then, it, then it's about a little boy who's about ten, who's German and an orphan and lives with his sister in a house with some other orphans. And it's how over the course of from like 19, I think it was seven or eight to 44, 45, 45 I think, their lives slowly do this. They ah, slowly interesting. Like and it's, it's, it's so beautifully written. I mean, it's it's another war story, and you hear all about the war, but you yeah. get this these whole different angles of it. It is really good. I'll read it. I mean, it's I'll read it. really good. And one other book, and then I'll shut up. Is Americana? Do you know? I that? read Americana. Did you like it? <clears throat> no, I did not love it. Tell me. Uh, you must have loved it because you brought I it did. up. I did. I really did. Yeah. yeah. What did you love about it? I loved. It. It's about a Nigerian girl who grows up in Nigeria and where where um, she's just a Nigerian and everybody wants to go to America. So she finally comes to America at the age of about 17 and discovers race. She had no idea that there was such a, such a thing as race. She had to go to the States to find out that she was other. Um, but it's very contemporary. It takes place now. And I like the fact that it was contemporary. It felt to me very immediate as opposed to some books about people from other places coming here that I can't connect with, and I've really connected with this one. Why didn't you love it? You're a good bookseller, because the book you just described is a book I would want to read, and I did not love it. I, d I didn't like anybody. But I love hearing about people who don't love I didn't like, not I like... didn't connect with any of them. I didn't like any of but them. But that's what's so cool. But I didn't connect with any of those characters at, or care. Really. But that's what's so interesting about books. You know? Oh, right. That's, the, that's what's right. so great. Right. That's why we have six, uh, ten booksellers here, because if Karen likes it, somebody else doesn't. Sure. If Megan loves it, so, you know, you got to have Do you it. guys reread? 
Is this a group yeah. that rereads? Yeah? No? No. Yeah. I have I have started in my middle age rereading much more than I ever did before. Especially when I'm like this travel, when it's hard, I pick up books that I have that I have turned to that have you know that I know are reliable. I know what I'm gonna get. I read last week was two weeks ago, I was on the West Coast. So I did LA, Seattle, Portland, Denver, and San Francisco. And and I'm running a business that's in New England. So I would have conference calls at 8 o'clock, which meant I had to have a conference call at 5 a.m., which meant really I had to get up at 4 so that I could be jazzy by 5. <laughs> and I was exhausted. So I, re I, re I started rereading things that I knew what I would get. And that would be, and I reread, have you read Joe Coomer's Pocket Full of Names? Yeah. I loved that book. And once again, two weeks ago, I loved it again. It just, <laughs> it was exactly what I thought it was going to be, you know. Yes. Um, it was beautiful, and I loved it. Sometimes. I, I, I don't love everything he does, but I loved that one. I thought that one was good. Well, thank you all for coming. I'd love to sign thank some books you. for you. <laughs>